Thank you. Well, we are almost at the home stretch, huh? <laughs> okay. Um, DVT and PE, very important topics in any management of critical care uh, facility. Oops, I think I passed one. Okay. So uh, venous thromboembolism, VTE, is a blood clotting condition that has two major manifestations, uh, DVT and PE. So the incidence of first-time VT is about 1 in 1,000 person per year. About one-third of them present as PE, and about two-thirds present as DVT. PE is usually a consequence of DVT. 40% uh, of, of the patients with proximal DVT are found with a PE, and about 70% with a PE are found with a DVT. Now, you know, these things vary, and, and I, I know when we see one, we always look for the other, but these are usually the rule of thumb. Within one month of diagnosis, mortality rate is about 6% for DVT and about 12% uh, for PE. So if you think about the number, uh, those, are, those are really high mortality rates. Now, there are a lot of risk factors that have been identified for VTE, uh, strong, intermediate, and, and weak. The strong ones, of course, being, being those postoperatively from orthopedic procedures, intermediate, some um, malignancy, arthroscopic uh, uh, procedures, pregnancy, postpartum. It's the ones with the weak risk factors I think that we see most as physicians, uh, those who's, who's been a bed rest for longer than three days, uh, immobility due to sitting. It says car or air travel longer than eight hours. That's a long flight travel, but you know, if you're really tired, I can imagine you'll be just sleep the whole time and you won't move. Um, increasing age, uh, laparoscopic surgery, obesity, BMI greater than 40. I don't know about you, but I have had plenty of patients in my time <laughs> whose BMI was greater than 40. Uh, pregnancy, antipartum, and varicose veins. So majority of the patients if, if that come to you with VTE, if you ask them, you can find at least one or multiple amounts, a uh, number of risk factors. So you've heard of this for child's triad. This is thought to be or explain the pathogenesis of uh, VTE, whether you have uh, one or more than one of these components that's gone disarray. You have hypercoagulable state, endothelial injury disrupting the flow, and venous stasis. And if you look at all the risk factors that we underwent, they sort of fit into one of those three states. Either it's creating a hypercoagulable state with a post-op phase or cancer, and like, likewise, endothelial injury with surgery and trauma, and venous stasis, and where heart failure actually, and, and obesity would fit into one of those um, uh, models. So how do they present? You've always seen patients with uh, DVT in the upper or lower extremities. You can see the sudden swelling of the affected limb, uh, pain and tenderness. They can get dorsiflexion uh, tenderness of the foot, uh, dilated superficial collateral veins, cyanotic or pallor, lack of distal pulses or warmth or skin or the thrombosis. But you know, diagnosing DVT is not that easy. Actually, it's quite challenging. DVT can occur asymptomatically, and these things can uh, be superimposed or occur with other conditions such as trauma, infection, and PAD, and what have you. And it has a lot of really potentially harmful sequelae. Uh, you can get post-pleuritic syndrome uh, from chronic, which can cause chronic pain, swelling, and you can see the you can see some um, uh, ulcerations here, varicose veins here, and chronic conditions develop actually in quite a lot of people, about 30 to 75 percent of the patients who has had DVT. And there's a lot of uh, um, uh, dysfunction and and quality of life of, of decrease because of uh, of the consequences of DVT. So how do we diagnose them? Well, you gotta take a very careful history um, and then do examination and, and look for the specific symptoms on, the effect, uh, on any affected uh, extremities. Of course, you use ultrasound, MRI, CTA, venography, well, though that is being used less and less, and D-dimer. Now, D-dimer, we use this test a lot. Um, it is a uh, fibrin degradation product, a small protein fragment that is detected after a blood clot is disintegrated from fiber analysis. Now it's fast, it's accurate, it's in everybody's emergency room, but it, is, it varies a lot between the, the, the clinical situation, the patient, and the assay that your, uh, your system has. So the strength is that the negative predictive value is very high, um, so it's only useful to rule out uh, VTE, not to rule it in or to diagnose it. So if you have a negative D-dimer and on a very low probability, uh, pre-test probability uh, patient, it's just that, that you know, it's sufficient to rule out a VTE. I think most of us will do an ultrasound anyway. 
Now, there's some major criteria and minor criteria for ultrasound diagnosis, and I've, I've listed some of the major ones here. The top two, the venous incompressibility and thrombus visualization, are the two of the most uh, specific and, and strong criteria. Uh, in ultrasound world, I think uh, all of these are combined and to improve the sensitivity of the examination. Uh, this uh, picture shows you uh, the um, uh, thrombus visualization, and here the uh, the, uh, the vessel here is not compressible. And actually, this is a very uh, good test, especially if, if you're somebody who's symptomatic by examination and, and by um, history. So there are several uh, models predicting DVT, uh, uh, and, and the Wells criteria is the one that is used most often and has been extensively validated. And you can see the scoring system there from presence of active cancer, paralysis, uh, recent immobilization, and, and different features of the physical exam of the foot from local tenderness to swelling and, and, and comparison to the, uh, the, the, the asymptomatic leg. And you can see that the, um, the low, uh, intermediate, and high uh, risk scores are from zero, one to two being uh, intermediate, and greater than three being high. So if you combine this with a D-dimer, and you have somebody with a well score of less than two, low probability, you order a D-dimer, and it's normal, actually DBT is ruled out. But if it's elevated, of course, you get an ultrasound, and, and from that on, point on, you could see if it's negative, and if it's negative, you repeat an ultrasound in a week, and if it's still negative, you ruled it out. If it's positive, you have ruled it in, or diagnosed it. Now, if you have somebody with well score of greater than two or high probability of DVT, you, you go immediately to the ultrasound, and if it's negative, you repeat it in a week, and if it's negative again, it, you have ruled, it out, uh, ruled out DVT, and if it's positive, you have diagnosed it. And of course, it's, if it's positive, uh, you treat it for the DVT. Now, uh, switching gears a little bit to the PE, uh, I've listed the, um, uh, the table for features of clinical presentation. This is from the, the most recent 2014 European Heart uh, Respiratory um, um, Group uh, guideline, and it's, it's, uh, that it's published in European Heart Journal. You can see that it's what we've always known, uh, and, but very varied in feature of presentation and combination, and no one, of course, being uh, um, uh, diagnostic. There are several series of initial evaluation and imaging that's required to diagnose pulmonary embolism. We all know somebody comes in with shortness of breath, and a lot of them do have chest pain. You'll get an EKG. And there's some, there are some uh, um, ones that we know strongly suggest a PE, such as the S1, T3, Q3, some T wave inversions. And you see this because of the strain on the right heart. Chest X-ray can also be helpful. You can see some these pleural-based wedge-shaped opacity called Hampton's hump. Of course, this sort of the, the very dark blank area, the Westermark sign, of course, this is because of the oligemia or relatively lack of blood flow due to the presence of the, uh, the pulmonary embolism. But again, none of these are very sensitive or very specific. So one thing that you gotta ask yourself is when you suspect somebody with a PE in presentation, is this acute or is this, uh, are they in shock or are they not in shock? That's what I meant to say. So if there's a shock component, hypotension, um, uh, end organ dysfunction and, and what have you, then you have a high risk patient. If they're otherwise stable, not high risk. And what you're trying to uh, uh, get from the clinical scenario is if their RV is so strained that it is in danger of, of uh, spiraling down to this really um, quick RV failure from RV dilatation to involving the tricuspid valve to decreasing contractility and then it, it goes onward to decrease in oxygen delivery and cardiogenic shock and death. So we all rely on a CT angiogram for a diagnosis of a QPE. You can see the pictures here with a very large degree of thrombus. And the uh, feature that uh, predicting the um, uh, predicting model for a PE, the scoring system is listed here. If there's an alternative diagnosis that's less likely than a PE, i.e. you really highly suspect PE, it's high score of three. Clinical signs and symptoms of DVT gets a three. Heart rate greater than 100, 1.5. Previous PE or DVT, another 
recent surgery in the past four weeks, or immobilization, gets another 1.5 score, or presence of cancer, or if they present with hemoptysis, each get a one. So if you have less than a two, you have a low probability, two to six, intermediate, or greater than, equal to seven, high probability. So with that, if you have somebody with a low uh, risk score for likelihood, you get a D-dimer. If it's negative, then uh, you have ruled out pulmonary embolism. If it's positive, then you go into imaging modality. If somebody has a high risk feature, then you go into either VQ scan or, or a CT, and then you treat them accordingly. Now, one of the consequences of a pulmonary embolism that I wish to mention is uh, CTEF, a chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. This is a very under-recognized phenomenon. This occurs because of a one or more thrombotic event that has a, had an incomplete resolution over time, and there's a buildup, layer after layer of thrombus in the pulmonary arteries that ultimately um, uh, affects the right ventricle, elevates the pressure, and that's how patients die. And this is, uh, can happen in a cumulative way over years after the initial insult and has been uh, uh, studied in, in, in a couple of different studies. Now, VQ scan is the test of choice to diagnose um, a chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, while CAT scan is probably as good or preferable to a VQ scan for an acute PE. There are subtleties because of the uh, fibrin uh, deposition and formation or change of the acute clot to a, a fibrin that can sometimes be missed on, on, a, on a CTA. So it is recommended or highly uh, recommended that a VQ scan be obtained for somebody that you still suspect a pulmonary embolism, but the PE is read as negative. For if you can see the sensitivity of detecting a chronic PE, you could see that it is markedly different. Now there are many, many studies studying, uh, comparing these two uh, uh, modalities and you get many different variables and, and numbers. But I think the take home message is CT is really good if you, uh, if you are suspecting or dealing with an acute situation. But if they have a high pretest probability and if that CAT scan is negative, I would not stop there. Go further, go one more step and, and get a VQ scan. Uh, this is uh, a surgery that cures or has the potential to cure CTEF. It's called thromboendorectomy. It requires a median sternotomy, not a thoracotomy. And you go under uh, cardiopulmonary bypass. You go into very, very deep hypothermia, a circle rest, and a, it's a true endorectomy. So they have to, they have to die, uh, uh, sort of laminate out layers of the, uh, the vessel uh, and, and sort of peel it off. And you can see the uh, samples here of the um, uh, peeled off structure. These are all thrombus in, in a patient. And so this is not an embolectomy, which we, I will mention in a little bit. So this is a, a, an example of a patient who underwent such a surgery. Again, you can see the just incredibly re remodeled right ventricle and, and, and normalized or almost normalized right ventricle after having undergone surgery. So this, this is really a truly life-saving measure. Now, as far as treatment, of course, anticoagulation is the, the root of the whole, whole therapy. Um, we you know, been raised and, and, and grown up with a, a vitamin K antagonist. Of course, now we have a lot more choices. There are still advantages of vitamin K antagonists. Of course, there are a lot of disadvantages as well, and, and meaning that you can monitor them, you can use them with renal dysfunction or renal failure. There, there is a, a reversal, you can reverse them with, with uh, vitamin K, but of course, from a patient standpoint, they really, really don't want to, want to be on morphine, at least those, that, those uh, patients that I deal with. So the new oral anticoagulation agents are listed here, from Devigatrin to Apixaban to Rivaroxaban. You could see the, the mechanism. They are really rapid onset of action. Uh, either, you either take it once a day or twice a day. Half-life is listed here. Uh, Devigatrin has, a, has the greatest amount of renal clearance, so uh, there's a strict criteria for who you, with a renal uh, function that uh, you can safely use. Now, Pixaban has the lowest amount of renal cl cl uh, clearance, so a bit more generous uh, uh, in, in, in GFR estimation that you can use. Uh, it does not require monitoring, and of course, there's no way to reverse the bleeding. Now, if you have somebody that has suspected PE without shock or hypotension, this is sort of the algorithm. Uh, you assess the clinical probability of the pulmonary embolism, and, and if it's low or intermediate, and then they suggest that you get a D-dimer. If it's negative, no treatment. If it's positive, then you get, you get a CAT scan. If it's no PE, then you don't need to get any further. Then if it's PE is confirmed, you treat. 
If you have somebody with high clinical sus suspect, then you get a CAT scan. If it's no PE, you really should investigate further. And if it's confirmed, then you treat. Now, if you have somebody who's in shock, hypotension, uh, and, and, and in a, in, in a um, dire straits, then you get a CAT scan, it's immediately available. If it isn't, then you get an echo, you start the treatment, and, and uh, um, you try to stabilize the patient. Now, this is a list of, sorry, this is a little bit out of order, but this is a list of all the phase three clinical trials for the new oral anticoagulation agent for the treatment of VTE, from Devagantran to Rivoxaverin and Apixaban, the one that we use here in the U.S. You could see the trial name, uh, the design, um, um, and the dosage that they used, and the outcome, and, and for, for the ones that have been approved, of course, they have been shown to be at least effective as the gold standard, which is warfarin. The, the safety outcome are here with major bleeding being the um, 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 problem or ser serious adverse event for almost every single one of the um, uh, clinical trials. So I think that these newer agents are gonna expand as far as its indication and, and the population of people that it's gonna be used. And as more and more uh, elderly population are being treated with these therapies, I think we really have to be judicious in how we dose them, what kind of drug we use, and, and following them uh, carefully for uh, risk of bleeding. Thrombolytic treatment, uh, these are the systemic thrombolysis that you can use for a QPE from streptokinase, urokinase, and RTPA. Uh, you could see the doses that are listed here. And this is not used very commonly. I think it's sort of regional and center dependent. Um, I think uh, a lot of people do um, uh, have tried either systemic or even catheter guided uh, uh, thrombolysis. But again, this is, uh, this is for people that present with a PE and hypotensive and, and, and you know that the clot burn is rapidly uh, uh, causing deterioration of, to their hemodynamics. You all know the contraindication to thrombolysis. I don't have to go over this with any kind of head, uh, recent head trauma, TIA, or stroke, and, 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 and any kind of a bleeding diathesis. They really should not be undergoing uh, thrombolysis. Again, if you have an interest or want to just brush up on this, really the uh, European Heart Journal 2014, it's really a great source of a, a, a um, a resource for you to just go through and, and get all the latest uh, information on this. Venous filters, it's indicated or it should be considered when patient is with an acute PE, has an acute PE and, and absolutely contraindicated with uh, using systemic anticoagulation. Um, it, should, it can be considered where you have somebody who failed uh, despite therapeutic uh, levels of anticoagulation. It is not to be used uh, for uh, patients with PE and, 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 and uh, for no other reason. And then I'm gonna end with this, with embolectomy for PE with shock. So embolectomy is, uh, requires a thoracotomy with cardiopulmonary bypass support. And you could, see the, um, you could see the specimen taken out here. And this is actually uh, being done more um, in, 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 uh, in centers world, um, in, in the country where you could actually restore the hemodynamics. You could uh, uh, take out the burden from the thrombus and, and, and actually restore blood flow in the most effective manner provided that you have the surgical team and you have the, uh, the personnel that actually uh, are able to do this. The, one of the other way that people have tried is the tran transvenous catheter embolectomy, uh, where you use a vacuum cup catheter, you place it in the um, affected pulmonary artery, you apply suction, and then uh, you kind of uh, aspirate it out to the cup. And, there, and of course, this is done with the, um, with the um, cardiology team for acute uh, pulmonary embolism. And with that, I'm, I think that's my last slide. Thank you very much. And I'll be here for questions later. Okay, thanks, Dr. Park.